Hi, everyone. Welcome to What's New in MPMI, the free uh, virtual seminar series of the MPMI Journal. While people are joining, are participating, are entering the room, please write into the chat um, where you're from. It's always fun to see uh, all people coming from all over the world. We're an international community, and that's one of the joys of this. We have Katerina Romanova from Germany, um, Jessica Torres Velez from Puerto Rico, Sopi Abdeslá from, uh, oops, I missed that, from Egypt, um, Yurav Chopra from the USA, uh, Ignacio Eduardo Maldonado Mendoza from uh, Sinaloa, Mexico, uh, Leticia Leclerc from France, Fernando Matteo from Argentina, Marqueta Macho from Germany. We've got people from everywhere today. Um, Sebastian from the Netherlands, um, Robin Kaup, Kaup, also from Utrecht from the Netherlands, Hao Wang from China. I'm sorry, it must be very um, early or late for you. Uh, Deanna Final Harris from Lincoln, Nebraska, US. Uh, Isla Hayati from Indonesia, also welcome. I know that's that's late for you. Um, more from Nebraska, Amelia from Redo from Canada, Veronica Chuko from Argentina, and Udita Acharya from India. Um, so many people, uh, Isla Hayati from Indonesia, and Lenka Berkatova Bur uh, uh, from the Czech Republic. And I know people are continuing to enter, so you can see where everybody's from. But one of the lovely things about this is that the uh, we're an international society. We're the International Society of Molecular Plant Microbe uh, Interactions. And that's one of the things that I enjoy the most about this seminar series is that it's a way for us to connect across the world, um, across many, many time zones. I really appreciate that folks, um, to share our fascination with this science and to uh, interact and engage with each other. Uh, this summer, I had the pleasure of seeing some of you at the international meeting in Providence, Rhode Island, but I also had a chance to meet some of my Colombian colleagues, um, Juan Carlos Caicedo at the University of Santa Ander because they invited me as a result of the connections that we developed through this con through this uh, international, through this uh, virtual seminar series. So that was a, a real pleasure and I really appreciated that opportunity. So this series is free and that's one of the key features. It's we're focused on inclusion, on sharing our science as widely as possible, reaching our entire community, uh, giving everybody a chance to be in the room with our authors and ask questions. It's a, a chance for our authors to reach out and connect with you, the readers, the listeners, outside of the pages of the journal. And it's, I know, very exciting because I, I know when you how you feel, you submit a paper and then you wonder, is anybody even reading this? And it's lovely to actually hear from people who are. And um, while we're waiting here, um, Karen, who is helping us out with support, is going to be, is going to um, put the link for the paper um, from Dr. Grover uh, so that you can, if you want to go deeper, you can take a look, feel free to um, click on that and head over to the paper to see some of the details and the methods. Um, we also have a couple of seminars coming up. We don't have one scheduled for next month, but we have a wonderful ones coming up in November uh, on bacterial effectors and the endomembrane system from uh, it's Gion and Cecile Segonzak from South Korea. And in December, we have Hasna Bubakri talking about um, a very difficult association to study, the actinorhizal symbiosis, uh, in this case, between um, ulnus and Frankia. So lots of very interesting stuff coming down the way. So now turning to today's feature, uh, I've been uh, excited to have uh, Sajan Grover, who is the first author of this paper, come and join us to talk about his work. Uh, this paper is from last September's issue and it has been one of the um, most cited and downloaded research articles from the journal from last year. And it's the same reason I chose it. It's, um, it's a very nuanced look at the interaction between plants and insects, in this case aphids, which everybody, you know, if you are in agriculture or if you garden, uh, everybody knows and, and fears. And 
what I loved about this interaction is that he's taking hormone signaling, but he is also taking this idea that we always have. We put things into bins. It makes it easier for us to think about resistant, susceptible, right? It's one or it's the other. And in fact, in real life, nothing fits, nothing fits equal perfectly in a binary system. And we all know that as human beings. And so this binary system of resistant and susceptible, it's, but it's our mindset. We have that mindset. And, and as I was chatting with uh, Sajan before the seminar, you know, you have these expectations and, and sometimes things can be flipped and that turns into a mystery um, that he ended up following up. And um, I will turn it over in a moment to Sajan Grover, but I first wanted to say he is now at Bayer uh, Crop Science, so he's got a lot of insight from industry and has really enjoyed having being in both worlds. Um, he's also recently, he shared with me, has recently been selected as an early career researcher um, in the field of plant uh, insect interactions for the Entomological Society of America and is going to be um, which is going to be featuring his work in an upcoming conference. So anybody who's there on the ground, will I hope you'll head over to hear him. Okay, Sajan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, welcome. And oh, I should say, I never introduced myself. I'm Jean Harris. I am the host and the organizer of this seminar series, um, which I've been doing since 2000. And um, it's given me a chance to meet and lots of people and to hear lots of really interesting science. So. Today, um, new topic, plants and insects, Sajan. Thank you so much, Jean, with for a great introduction. And I will share my slides and I will also introduce myself a little bit more in detail. Um, I hope my slides are visible to you. Looks great. Yes. Um, so as Jean already mentioned, um, the topic I'll be talking about today is one of the paper published in MPMI last year. And then um, the title of this topic is Dichotomous Role of Jasmonic Acid in Modulating Sorghum Defense Against Aphids. So before I start uh, talking about the research, I would just like to introduce myself a little bit in detail, like what's my career metamorphosis. So right after the school, when I um, I did my bachelor's of science in agricultural in Punjabi University, India, and I finished my bachelor's in 2013, and then I started my master's of science in entomology in Punjab Agriculture University. So during the master's, I worked on RNAi in whitefly, where we try to identify the function of few genes using RNAi technique. And once I finished my master's, I kind of made up my mind that, okay, I want to go into research and I would like to pursue for PhD. And then I came to US in 2017 um, to uh, start my PhD in entomology with an amazing advisor, Dr. Joe Lewis. And I was there for like for five years, uh, including my PhD and a postdoc. And during my PhD, when I was, um, I was working on plant aphid interactions, although I had a like, um, project on fall armyworm or other insects as well, but most of the work uh, was focused on sap sucking insects, mainly different aphid species. And as I was getting close to the PhD, I was kind of like figuring out what I want to do next. Should I uh, like, do I want to go to industry or academia? And that time I just wanted to explore the industry side of, um, of the research, like how it works, if I'll be a good fit there. And during my PhD, I went for an internship at Corteva Agri Science, where I was a biochemistry intern and I worked on microbial physiology. And then that's what I figured. That's the time when I figured that, okay, I can also quit in industry and that's another career path maybe I could choose in future. And once I finished my PhD, I stayed there as a postdoc for a few months in the same lab. And then I got a job at Bayer Group Science as a scientist too. I'm a print testing. It was specifically focused on sap sucking insects. And in this role, it was, I worked mainly in vitro, mostly in the lab, uh, like automation, worked closely with the protein sciences. And I stayed in this role for like one year and six months. And recently I have moved on to a new role as a senior scientist this year, a few months back. And this is highly focused on plant insect interactions, what I have been doing during my PhD. So I'm really excited for the um, for the next step. 
and the work today i'm going to present today is the is the work that i did during my phd with dr joe louis and during my postdoc as well okay so but um since i am from entomology background although i worked on plant insect interactions all of you might not like know all of the insect related terms and i just put it together like so i can give a little bit description about that what does it mean and because we'll be using these terms in the next slides like um, like a lot so the first thing hemipteran insects even you have seen this word in the previous slide this is the order of the insects hemiptera and it has all of basically it has sap sucking insects um they feed on like they are not they do not chew on the leaves they just suck the sap from the plants and the other term is no choice assays this is uh, one kind of bioassays um so in which like you, you have a plant insects you do not give any choice to the uh, to the insects it means they have to feed on that plant and then we just looked at the growth reproduction depending on the type of insect we are working on and the other assays we did is choice assays this is these are the insect preference assays when they are allowed to choose between the plants and and we can study their preferences like how um um like what they prefer what would they like to feed on and the another technique is electrical penetration graph this like in a, in a short form it's abbreviated as epg this is a technique to study feeding behavior of sap sucking insects um i will be talking about this technique uh, in detail in the next slides but using this technique you can precisely find out that where the aphids are feeding or what kind of cells of the plant the aphids are feeding okay so talking about sorghum and sugarcane aphids sorghum is one of the most important crops cultivated worldwide and it is grown as a cereal crop as a livestock feed and also it's produced for the ethanol bioproduction or the biomass but um like as sorghum has gained more attention like in the agriculture landscape in the in the last decade and with that we also had one uh, one guest like unwelcome guest for the sorghum that is melana fisakeri and you can see those these are the very teeny small aphids they are present on the sorghum leaf like in hundreds and uh, like maybe in thousands so it's hard to count and this is a magnified view where you can see that there is an adult aphid along with the different life stages and they have a uh, like piercing sucking type mouth parts they can use those near like mouth parts put into the plant and suck the plant sap and it was not historically recognized as a pest and for the first time it was detected in like texas gulf coast and louisiana in 2013 and then slowly it spread to the another parts in the us where the sorghums are being grown this is just a picture of the sorghum production in us like this is a old slide from 2018 like you can see that these are some of the areas where the sorghum is grown and particularly in the midwest in the southeastern uh, southern region and these are some of the top states where the sorghum is grown and as i told that sorghum aphid like sugarcane aphid it was first recognized as a pest in 2013 and in by the 2021 it has um, spread to almost 90 percent of the sorghum growing areas in us so which means it's a it's a threat to the sorghum production and at the same time it can reduce the yield drastically and so when we are looking for the sustainable pest management strategies um so i think uh, plant insect interaction is one of the important area like in which we are working on but before that i would like to highlight uh, for some of the non entomologist people how these insects feed and what kind of damage they can cause so th this is uh, you can see that this is the picture of plant in our greenhouses when we do the assays like they can they um, they can reproduce like in hundreds or in thousands depending on the, what kind of assays we are doing and sometimes it becomes very hard to count and when they suck on these plant sap they they excrete honeydew that's a sugary substance they excrete and you can see this this uh, stickiness on these leaves and that can promote sooty mold and that can affect the photosynthetic efficiency of the plants negatively and ultimately impacting the um, ultimately impacting the plant health okay 
so these hemipterans when when i say like they are piercing sucking inside uh piercing sucking type of insects but they also suck like literally so you can see the picture of the aphid here where they are using their stylets to pierce into the plant tissues so basically what they do they kind of sample all different cells like epidermal cells mesophyll cells and then they just keep poking into different cells until they reach in um, they reach into the suitable feeding site and most of the time for the for the aphid is usually phloem where they ingest uh, where they ingest the phloem sap and this is the figure from one of the papers we published in current opinion in plant biology in 2020 and this is just uh, like highlighting the importance of omic ap approaches to decipher the plant defenses against these aphids or other sap sucking insects. So when they feed onto plants, they can also secrete saliva. And um, basically, like plants can induce defense responses in, in response to aphid attack, but aphids can secrete saliva to suppress those plant defenses. And these kind of dynamic interactions, they result, uh, they result into uh, either like either like in, aphids can feed on the plants really well. Or, uh, or they won't because the plant defenses win. So just to capture these dynamic interactions, there are several omic approaches available these days, like transcriptomics, metabolomics, proteomics, cutelomics, and then there are certain te techniques we use to, to dig into more, um, to, to effect biology, like insect bioassays, using microscopy, EPG, and then we can try to link those results with the omics data to dig deep into the to dig deep into these results. So uh, moving on to that and talking about plant insect interactions and sorghum sugar cannabinoid interactions, this is a this is an image from my Texas Row Crops newsletter. Here what they have shown that susceptible versus resistant line. So if we look at these plants, how how big impact we can make by studying plant insect interactions and specifically if we can make a product out of it. Um, so I'll be uh, talking about this research into two different parts. One part I'll be focusing on how we how we ended up with this research question, why we think JA has a dual role, just Monique has, has a dual role. And second, how we established or proved those findings and how we provided those genetic evidences. So starting with the first uh, first part, where this story actually started from my previous paper published in Plant Molecular Biology in 2020, where we had these 10 different nested association mapping alternate parents. They are from different parts of the world, and then they were closed with the reference parent RTX430. And using these closes, the nested association population uh, was, was developed. And we were just screening these alternate parents. And when we screened those in that paper, we found that SC265, which is from Burkina Faso, that provides, that provides resistance to sugarcane aphids. So the first thing we did is no choice assays. So in this case, we have two week old plants. And once the plants are 14 days old, we put five aphids on each plant, covered the plants with cages, so they will have, and we do the aphid count after seven days and so that they will have enough time to develop and reproduce and by counting the number of aphids we can tell that uh, like how the plant defenses are impacting the aphid biology and what we have seen uh, in case of rtx430 when the numbers were around like around 160 170 but in sa265 the resistant line the numbers were like 70 80 it was even more than 50% reduction in the aphid count, what we saw on SA265. And this was a very, very powerful line in providing resistance to aphids. And then we did choice assays, where we give a preference or chance for the aphids to choose the plants, uh, plants of their choice. And we have RTX on one side, SA265 on one side, and when we release 20 aphids in the middle of the, in the middle of the pod and then counted the number of aphids on each plant after six hours and 24 hours. And what we found that the aphids did not prefer SC265 plant to settle on or to feed on. So this was, there is something very strong in SC265 that doesn't, aphids did, don't like them, but even if they have to feed, they do not reproduce or grow as much as, uh, as much as the other line. 
so we were trying to dig into like we were trying to dig into more detailed mechanism what's happening and then we used electrical penetration graph technique this is this is such a powerful tool like what you can use to assess the feeding behavior of aphids and this setup has two components one is plant electrode another is insect electrode the plant electrode is the thick copper wire that goes into the soil of the potted plant and then if it it, it is glued with the thin um, thin gold wire and uh, attached to the dorsum side of the aphid. So with this circuit, when the plant is electrified and if we put the aphid on the plant and if we insert stylets into the plant tissues, the circuit gets complete. And as they are feeding onto the different tissues of the plant, you, you find different waveform patterns. And this is one of the like representation of how the EPG waveform looks like. So let's say uh, then there could be different phases, like the results can be divided into. The first thing is like pathway phase. Pathway phase is when aphids are trying to locate the suitable feeding site and we, when they are trying to poke into all different cells, you, you, uh, you have this kind of waveform patterns. So let's say when they feed on water or in the xylem, on the xylem sap, the voltage is like goes a little bit towards positive and it's, it's more consistent. And here is a small um, like waveform pattern of sieve element when they're, then when they're feeding on phloem and it has a negative voltage. And then we record it for like eight hours and eight hours, then we see how much time if it's spent into pathway phase, how much time they spent into xylem and flowing. And then we compare those results. And when we looked at that for RTX 430 and the resistant line SC265 that's highlighted in this uh, black color. And what we saw, um, there is a significant reduction in the C element phase duration that's flowing. So if it spent significantly less time in the flowing phase in those eight hours compared to pathway phase when they have to spend more time figuring out what sites they should feed on or what are, what are good sites for them. But then there are other phases like feeding on xylem, non-probing like when they're doing nothing. And there is another parameter, FSCP. This is like um, the first time they reached into, like how long did it, did it take for aphids to reach into first sieve element phase during those feeding. And we found significant differences in the pathway phase and the sieve element phase. And it kind of gives us an idea that maybe something, because they feed on phloem, or it could be something later to phloem, phloem-based resistance in, in, this, uh, in this system, sodium and sugarcane uh, aphid system. And, and with that, um, then we want to dig into more details like jasmonic acid and the salicylic acid. These are the main phytohormones that has been studied against uh, pathogens and insects, specifically in response to biotic stress. You might have already known from the pathogen side, but I just wanted to give a very like broad overview from the insect side. When it comes to insects, they are divided into two different feeding yields. One is chewing type insects, when they can actually chew on the leaves and cause mechanical damage like the caterpillars. You can see a bigger holes on the plants and it's it's a, it's extensive damage they cause. And then there are sap sucking insects like aphids. They insert their stylets into the plant tissues while their like damage might not be visible right away. And they then they try onto different plants and reach to the phloem cells, feed on it and cause minimal injury. And they are hemibiotrophs, and basically they feed on the plant plants while keeping the cells alive, so they can nourish themselves. Since their mode of feeding is different, plant recognizes these defenses very differently. So once plant recognizes this different kind of insect attack, it can induce its plant defense signaling pathways. In case of caterpillars, there is jasmonic acid. In case of aphids, which which mimics more closely to pathogens, it's salicylic acid. And then there are tons of reports in different systems which shows that they can be antagonistic to each other. So this is just kind of kind of background I wanted to provide before I just present the results, what we found in our case. So um, this is like more into detailed view, like looking at the pathways. When insects feed onto the feed onto the plants, they can disrupt the lipid bilayer in the in the in the membrane of the plant cells. 
and then with that it can um it, it can um it can produce linoleic acids and then going through several enzymatic reactions and it produces jasmonic acid and then jasmonic acid gets conjugated with isoleucine which is a biological active form of jasmonic acid and on the other hand while well, it can also produce salicylic acid and salicylic acid gets synthesized through shikimate pathway from corismate but it can happen through different pathways ics and pal depending on the different uh, different plant systems so uh, and again they can be antagonistic to each other so coming coming to the phytohormones quantification so in in our study what we did when we had two week old plants we put aphids on one set of plants then aphids and the other plants other set of plants were uninfested like no aphids on those plants and then we collected the samples after uh, after certain time points so we took samples at early time points and then late time points for for early it's 0 hour 1 hour and 24 hour and for late time points it's day 7 control and sugarcane aphid infested once to, once we collect those samples they were flash frozen and they were ground in tissue lysers, and then they were submitted to UNL proteomics and metabolomics score facility. And they run those samples in UHPL CMS and then give the data back to us and we analyze the data. So we collaborated with them for this, for this part of the study for the metabolomics. So what we found. Um, as I talked before, in case of aphids, since they mimic like pathogens, assay could be one of the main phytohormone that can get induced. So um, in case of early time points and late time points, um, so if you look at the early time points, that's zero hour. And when like it's, we just look, we can compare the constitutive expression between RTX430 and SC265. Even when there are no aphids, the resistant line had a, had a very high levels of salicylic acid, maybe 10 times more the RTX430. And then it didn't change at one hour, but at 24 hour, it goes really high. And the similar trend, and the similar trend we saw at late time points, even it was higher um, at seven days post infestation. And this is something that was not like unexpected. We, we kind of figured that there might be salicylic acid since we know about that. But then here comes the surprising part when we looked at the jasmonic acid. So jasmonic acid, it gets induced in SC265, the resistant line at one hour, and while it was also higher at 24 hours, but slightly less than one hour. But then at seven days, we didn't find any differences. There was just changes in the GA levels at early time points. So that leads to a question what jasmonic acid is doing. Right, like, like why, why there is a need when when plants can defend themselves against like using SA? What what is GA doing here? So, so then we wanted to look into more details and looked at the and want to look at the um, functions of GA, and we started with the simple experiments exogenous applications. And so we had two genotypes, RTX430 and SC265, and these plants were two weeks old. This is the same stage we used for all of the experiments. For one set of plants, they were controlled, just sprayed with water, but then for the, for the uh, and the other set of plants were sprayed with jasmonic acid isoleucine. And we let them absorb for 24 hours and then infested the plants with five aphids on, on each set. And then we keep counting the aphids from day one to day seven. So we can look at the trend on both of the genotypes. And then this is what we found. There are two different graphs for, one is for RTX430 and the lower is for SC265. And what we found that although in RTX430, we could find a like very slight difference on, the, on day five in the aphid numbers, but we saw higher number of aphids in jasmonic acid application like treatments in RTX430. But the similar trend we have seen in SA265, but it's just much stronger than RTX430. Maybe it's more responsive to jasmonic acid. And from these experiments, we figured that the exogenous application of JA, it can promote SA growth and it's providing susceptibility to the plants. So it, it was a little different from the reports what we have seen before in sorghum. There were just few reports. 
and then um so we thought like okay so there we want to do another experiment with ndga ndga is a is a ja inhibitor that can impact um the ja pathway specifically uh, on the locks and ultimately reduce the ga accumulation and then we wanted to do a choice assays since these were the early time points and we already knew that sc265 the resistant genotype can induce jasmonic acid so these are the choice assays we did and looking at the upper graph then we sprayed only the resistant plants with ndga knocked down the ja accumulation in that plant we didn't find any difference in the settling behavior of aphids while we know that SC plant aphids do not like to settle on SC265. And then we just had only SC265, the resistant line, and the resistant line with JA inhibitors. And the aphid preferences change. They like to settle on that. And it was very, very different from what we found in the previous essays that when um, JA repels aphids here, this is the early time points, but at late time points, it provides susceptibility. It kinds of it it leads to a little bit of confusing statements. We were not sure what's going on here. So, and then what what we we wanted to do next is uh, looking at the genetic evidence, and this is the second part of the study when we were not sure about the pharmacological experiments, how confident we can be on them. And we had Dr. Zengu Zin, like um, in Texas, we collaborated with them and tried to obtain the C jasmonic acid uh, mutants. They are not exactly jasmonic acid mutants, but they were MSD3 mutants, which encodes for fatty acid desaturase. And if there is a knockdown of that, it can knock down the JA pathway and ultimately leads to the reduced jasmonic acid accumulation. Although this, um, um, these seeds were in different genetic background, but we still wanted to proceed with that. And just wanted to make sure that even the aphid in, in, uh, infestation do not induce GA in this mutant. So we had uh, wild type and MSG3. And after putting the aphids on that, we looked at the jasmonic, jasmonic acid levels and it did not change. And we can see that even at the basal level, there was a GA levels were different in wild type. So, um, and then we wanted to do the bioassay to see, uh, to just to make sure like what we found before is still applies to the uh, different genetic background and we can provide a genetic evidence for that. So we did the bioassays, no choice bioassays, the wild type and MSD3 and we found a significant reduction in the aphid numbers in jasmonic acid mutant. And even here is a picture of jasmonic acid, um, jasmonic acid mutant after aphid infestation, and we can see there is a huge uh, difference in the number of aphids. And then we found that sorghum plants, they, which are deficient in jasmonic acid, it, can, it provides enhanced resistance. Or in other words, jasmonic acid can provide susceptibility to aphids. And going further, we wanted to make sure that since it's a, like uh, if, if we apply jasmonic acid exogenously, does it compromise for resistance? So we use the same setup, wild type MSG3 plant, sprayed it with jasmonic acid isoleucine, and then have five aphids on each plant, and then did the aphid count on cementase. And other thing we did is EPG, uh, just looking at the feeding behavior after JA application. Here, um, there is another, there is my lab mate, Dr. Hina Puri. Uh, she's, she's graduated with her PhD now. And that time she really uh, helped with all of the experiments moving forward. And then um, specifically for the EPG experiments, uh, she did it independently for this project. Um, so when we looked at that, the aphid numbers after spraying jasmonic acid, and what we found that in the mutant plants, when there is no jasmonic acid, if you apply jasmonic acid to that, it increases the aphid numbers. It compromises the resistance. Just to make sure JA is, uh, is the compound that's altering the plant defenses. And we also found those differences in the EPG. After JA application, if it's fed more on those plants, they spend significant more time in the flowing, uh, in the JA, uh, JA applied mutants.
So, um, and that was all about no choice essays. Then we did the choice essays and wanted to make sure that we are seeing the same trend, though, like, you know, different effects of JA, but we have seen with the pharmacological studies before. And in this case, we again used MSD mutant. And if we compare the ifid number, uh, number of aphids settling on wild type and MSD3, we found there are more aphids settled on MSD3 since there is no JA. And then um, when we sprayed JA uh, on those MSD3 plants, if we uh, didn't prefer like one plants over the another, uh, the results were like non-significant. So um, basically, it shows the it shows the same result, but we found in the pharmacological studies. And then we wanted to so it, for for the choice assays, JA repels the aphids. It was still documented before because if we, they can rely on the volatiles released by the plants. But then later, how it is providing susceptibility, that is something we really wanted to, we really wanted to know, dig into the mechanisms. So for that, um, so these are the two waveforms I have shown here in the RTX430, which is the reference line, SC265 resistant line. And we found the significant differences in the flowing feeding. In this system, through like multiple experiments, we will we were able to establish that um, if it feeding on the plant, specifically on the phloem, is somewhere uh, very strongly correlated with the aphid growth reproduction, and there could be something related to phloem. Like why they why they spend less time in phloem? Don't they like phloem? What's in the phloem sap? Or was there something else that didn't that just didn't allow aphids to go into phloem? So there, there were like multiple questions coming into mind. And, and when we think about phloem sap or phloem, although there, there are a lot of comp uh, ingredients present in phloem, but sugars are one of the important or one of the main ingredients in the phloem sap. And we wanted to look at that because if it's, they rely on sugars a lot for their, for, for their feeding. And we, we, uh, we looked at the, uh, we looked at the different sugars free sugars levels in uh, in, uh, in the wild type and MSG3 mutant before and after aphid infestation. And we found significant differences in two of the sugars, fructose and trehalose, that after aphid infestation, the levels go real high compared to wild type. And um, so we, we were like, maybe these are the sugars that's causing something but at the same time, we didn't find much glucose or difference in the raffinose there, but there was some difference in the sucrose that could potentially impact fructose and trehalose. And so these are the results we, we found and they were really interesting. And then we wanted to check like if these, if these sugars can impact uh, aphid reproduction or growth. So for that, we did artificial diet bioassays. We had a small petri plates we put five aphids in each petri plate, have one parafilm layer. And on top of that parafilm layer, we provided um, sucrose diet. And we had different treatments, sucrose diet with little bit of fructose, like 50 and 200 micromolar of fructose and trehalose in the different treatments. And once we put the diet on the one layer of parafilm, we covered it with the, another layer of parafilm. And so the diet is spread. And this is a kind of magnified view, like if it's our feeding on those uh, on those sugars, and then so we could compare the results, uh, like if fructose and trehalose are impacting those. And control is just 15% sucrose solution, but most of the papers have used, and we let them feed for like three days. And what we found that even at the lowest concentrations of fructose and trehalose at 50 micromolar, they significantly reduce the aphid numbers. They reproduce less, they grew less in these treatments. And they had a significant impact on the sugar cane, aphid growth and reproduction adversely. So, and this is a kind, kind of model like we kind of prepared. So then when aphids feed on plants, like at early time points, there is desmonic acid that can repel the aphids away. But, if, if it stay on those plants and go for a longer term, and then it can impact the sugar metabolism that can further impact the aphid growth. 
or it could be just a phase they might be tricking plants here by inducing JA levels to proliferate, to grow more. That's a very complex interaction. And as Gian mentioned in the starting that, sometimes it's not just, you know, white and black. There is a big gray zone. It's, it's something that cannot just fit into binary system. And that's what we figured from this, uh, from this story. So um, when we talk about that study, we have done some follow-up experiments after that, and those are not published yet, but I just wanted to highlight a bigger picture that what, what could be some of the follow-up steps. Like when insects feed onto the plants, there could be two kinds of defenses, direct defenses and the indirect one. Direct is something what plants produce like internally, impacting sugars, flavonoids, or any kind of insecticidal toxins that can impact if a uh, plant uh, insect directly. But indirect is something when they impact the volatiles, and maybe the, those volatiles are able to attract natural enemies of the plant and uh, of the insect and reduce the insect population. And this is, maybe JA is responsible for some of the trade-off between um, direct and indirect defenses, that's something we would like to uh, look into future, in the, into the future studies. And coming to the significance, so I feel like these kind of studies are very important, like going forward when we are trying to unlock the natural potential of the plants, and then these, uh, these kind of defense mechanisms, they can, like, they can contribute to the breeding programs and um, ultimately help us to reduce the chemical load on the agricultural crops. And with, with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, my lab members from Pla Molecular Plant Insect Interactions Lab. So they provide a huge support during those five years in that lab, specifically my advisor, Dr. Joe Lewis, and our collaborators, Dr. Zangozin, Dr. Scott Sattler, and also Department of Entomology, Nebraska Lincoln, NSF for funding. And if you would like to connect us with more, like this is the QR code to scan. Uh, to look at the Molecular Plant Insect Interactions Lab website. And this is a QR code for my LinkedIn profile if you would like to connect more. And thank you so much. With that, I would like to take any questions if you have. Thank you. Terrific talk, Sajan. Really enjoyed that. And I appreciate you putting up your contact info because that's something that people often forget that you really can contact the authors and ask them questions in more detail. And, and the um, corresponding author's email is always there. So terrific. I see lots of applause coming up from the audience. You did a great job. Um, and I'd like to explore some of these ideas a little bit more. Um, people who have questions, please type them into the Q&A. And I see we already have one there. Why don't you stop sharing your slides, Sajan? And then we can just, yeah, perfect. So um, I see some coming up already. So even though we were typing things in the chat before, just put your questions in the Q&A and I will read them in order. So first of all, I really liked the whole logical series of questions like, oh, we found this. Well, let's test that. Well, let's just feed them trailos or crypto. So uh, it's, a, it's a lovely set of um, logical experiments. Okay, so Robin uh, Kaup asks, did the resistant sorghum line have stunted growth because of high basal SA levels? That's an excellent question. Yes, since there are different genetic backgrounds and SC265, it was stunted compared to the reference line. And even we could see that even going forward, that plant has a shorter height and there were some other differences we could observe. So yeah, we just took the idea from that line and then validated that using, um, so that we could provide a genetic evidence for that. Right, good question. And there's so many differences in some of these different lines, but um, you're right, that's that whole, variety of, of sorghum is what gives you a chance to, to find some of these mechanisms. Okay, Jerome Muss asks, do you think that the sugars play a role in every crop or only in sugarcane sorghum? Um, I, I think sugars play an important role not just for the defenses, even for the plant development, other plant physiological aspects. 
and I think they are important in maybe every group. Like it's hard for me to say every group, but they are reported in other groups as well. So um, if we talk about the plant defenses, there are they, these some of things have been established in Arabidopsis or Nicotiana like model plants. But there are more studies in those model plants compared to the um, agricultural crops. Yes, excellent. In fact, I believe we had a talk not too long ago on Trelos and Pseudomonas. I'll have to I'll have to look back for that. Um, lots of interesting connections. Okay, um, Janak Joshi, previous speaker. Um, thanks for coming back, Janak. Um, says, great presentation. What do you propose to manage aphids in sorghum? A JA mutation? That, that's a great question. I think uh, before we answer this question, it becomes really important to look at the other aspects. So for example, farmers, they are interested in yield at the last, right? So if we go JA GA mutation, we looked at the early stage and we found that it can reduce the aphid population, but then we also need to look at further. But this is a great, like, I think, start, but then going further, we need to look at the reproductive stages. If JA defenses, it, it's much more complex. Maybe they might be different in those stages. One thing, and second, um, as I have briefly mentioned about the antagonism between JA and SA, and I think, it also depends where, in which area you are growing sorghum. If there is aphid attack, maybe yes, but then if there is a more caterpillar attack, I don't know how that's gonna behave. So that's something like I have learned in industry, while we focus on target pests, we should also like focus on non-target pests as well. So some recommendations can be made. That's a very good point. Okay, um, Mike Kolomitz asks, asks your earlier work in maize showed that OPDA is more important than JA for defense against aphids. Do you see any effect of OPDA? That's always interesting. That's a complex set of metabolites. Right. Uh, so the, our previous work that was in maize and corn leaf aphid, just for the context of rest of the audience, and this work is sorghum and sugarcane aphid. These are the different plant insect systems. We did not find any differences in the OPDA levels in this case. But if you look at our 2020 paper published in Plant Molecular Biology, then like in that paper, we identified a tolerant line, SC35. That's one of the genotype from the NAM alternate parents. So when I say tolerant, it means that uh, it could sustain a uh, like huge number of aphids without impacting the plant growth relatively to uh, reference line. So if you look at that paper, in that line, we found OPDA levels were really, really high, but not, not JA. So that kind of gives us an idea about maybe it's different in the different plant systems. It's hard to say anything at this, this moment, but maybe it is something point where plant defense trade-off is happening. So maybe that's something worth studying further, but if the tolerant line has more OPDA, but not JA, but the resistant line has more JA, that's something worth to look into it. And, but there are some papers published on OPDA as well, when they have talked about plant defense trade-off switch. So this is a very interesting point. Interesting. So everybody is wondering about their favorite insect pest. So Sunil, uh, Kumar asks, do you think that this mechanism is conserved in all other hem hem hemapterans like whitefly? Um, I, I think so. There are papers on whitefly, which shows that sugars are very important for them, like for, this, for their survival. But then a slight, you know, uh, like even the change in the composition of sugars that can really distort their osmotic balance. So... I think maybe it might go for all of the sap sucking insects. But the okay. extent could vary. <laughs> so Elijah Ajene, I'm not sure I pronounced that right, sorry, 
um, has a very good question. How do you get the aphid trapped at the back with the electronic machine looking at how minute or small the aphids can be? It's true. You showed us. These are very, very small insects. How do you actually do that? First part of the assay. Yes. <laughs> so I think that's a, that's a very tricky step. And that's something I think in the starting, it takes it takes a lot of time to practice. You, you start under the microscope and spend a lot of time, maybe like spending 20 minutes gluing one aphid, but then slowly with the practice, you can be really fast, maybe one minute per aphid. So then even you do not need microscope. It's it's just a matter of time. I could so see those differences when I joined PhD versus when I ended PhD. So there was a huge difference. That's really funny. Um, interesting to see. I did used to work on C. elegans, and I can tell you after like three years of looking at them under the microscope, you get really, really fast at moving them. So I can imagine the same with um, these insects, but it is kind of crazy to see that glued on their back and that you can actually complete the circuit. I love that, that assay. Okay, thanks for that little bit of detail. Um, that's the kind of thing that you never really see in the methods of a paper. It's kind of like starting a recipe with first you catch your chicken. Um, and so thanks for that. Brian uh, Push, thanks, welcome back, um, is asking, is the geographic spread of the aphids over time correlated to the increase in acreage planted to sorghum? Or is the spread an invasion over time? That's a good question. It's it's mostly the spread and invasion over the time, but sorghum plant, uh, plant you know, where the sorghum is being planted, the area has also grown over the time. But it's not the same as sugarcane aphids are much faster than sorghum. So, um, Janak Joshi has another question. Says that's where I'm coming. JA is known to be associated with protecting necrotrophs, so there might be undesirable consequences on mold growth or any necrotroph uh, necrotrophic pathogens. So that's. Oh, there are all these trade-offs, of course, in the real world, the plant is never exposed to simply aphids. So what do you think about that? I think that that's true. Um, it, it's hard to comment it's hard to comment on this because I think it's it's much more complex than that. Um, because, for example, when we are studying aphids, they are excreting honeydew. And then the, depending on how much if how how many aphids are there, that can impact the amount of honeydew. More the honeydew, more substrate for sooty malt. So it's 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 kind of hard to figure out and tease apart tease apart that what caused what. So we haven't gone that far, but that's really that's really interesting point. That, that's exactly right. That the those aphids are secreting a lot of sugars right on the surface of the leaf. Um, I imagine there's some very interesting tripartite interactions there. Okay, um, Kishore Varma Penumatsa asks, can exogenous application of JA or SA reduce plant virus transmission by aphids in sugarcane? Um, I, I really haven't come across any study, but that might be, that might be worth studying. <laughs> so I, I feel like if they can, there are also some studies on like phytohormones, how they can impact the feeding behavior. And the feeding behavior is related to the plant virus transmission. Yes, they can impact, but then positively or negatively, it's it's hard to say since that can vary from one system to another. It is curious to think about how that might impact virus transmission. That'll be an interesting future area. Um, okay, Dr. Bilal Hossein says, uh, just has a comment. Thanks for your great work. JA may be applicable in maize against aphids. So yes, maize and sorghum, very similar uh, in many ways. And we have another question. Is the effector from aphid known that interferes with sugar protection, production metabolism that can be used for engineering resistance in sorghum? That's an, that that's an excellent point. I think um, this, although like we are, um, we, we can see like there are a lot of papers being published like on plant insect interactions. I feel like still there is 
like the plant side is still heavier than insect side. We do not see a lot of papers compared um, in, in case of insects compared to plants. Although there are a few papers that can, they show that if it is have a, you know, th this create a lot of like effectors, elicitors into the plant and that can certainly interfere with, that can certainly hijack the plant, you know, but, um, like plant metabolome. So I feel like, uh, yes, there is a possibility, but, but then how and how is it happening? Mechanisms, it's, I don't know that. <laughs> well, this gives me a chance to plug our upcoming focus issue, which is effectors at the interface of plant microbe interactions. And we are still accepting submissions for that. This, I believe that this is expected to come out in March or April of the fall of, of 2024. So, but we would love to have more insect effector uh, papers than that. So please consider it. And I think that um, we can type, put the link, add the link for that into the chat so that you can find it. But you can also find it by going to the MPMI homepage. Okay. Um, Kian Zhu Salsman asks, have you pursued SA effects in terms of the SCA responses? Um, so the question is, have you pursued SA effects in terms of SA, SCA responses? So, um, so when we looked at the SA levels in MSD3 in JA mutant, after, before and after sugarcane aphid infestations, we did not find any significant differences in the SA levels. And, but we haven't done the studies after, like if we do the pharmacological applications, how does it impact? Because we just um, quantified the SA at one time point, day seven, that's it. But I think phytohormones can be complex. We might have missed that. So, but th that's a great point. Right, it'll be interesting to see. So Manvi Sharma asks, are aphid effectors always responsible for initiating plant defenses? That's what I can say. Um, like I wouldn't, I won't use the term effectors, but then aphid saliva, yes, because that's the one of the way plants recognize the insect. Once plants recognize it and it can initiate the plant defense. But then it depend it depends on how powerful the how powerful the ins, insect saliva is if that can beat the plant defenses or not and that could also vary from one plant system to another one if it species to another whether it's journalist or specialist um, that reminds me uh, in our lab we published one paper on green bugs and sugarcane aphids both are the aphid species on sorghum and what we have seen that sugarcane aphid what I presented today, it is more specialist. It is a particular aphid pest on sorghum. But the another aphid we studied, it likes sorghum, it comes on sorghum, but that's more like a generalist pest. And it goes to the other crops as well. And when we put those aphids on the plant and looked at the plant defenses, there was a, there was a huge difference. Sugarcane aphids can keep the defenses low compared to the other aphids. And so I feel like both of the different aphid species have different effectors, different elicitors that can cause that. So yes, it impacts plant defenses, but again, negatively or positively, we don't know. <laughs> Interesting. I also wonder how much of it is like membrane disruption. You don't get a lot of physical skull wall disruption because of those very narrow stylets, maybe some. But I do wonder about all those membranes they're passing through on their way to get to the sieve tube elements. Um, so we're going to be finishing up very soon. Um, people are wondering, are very excited about the, the potential of this for biological control in sorghum and also, uh, other, other insects, uh, like whitefly. And finally, I want to end with Gulzamal Mukianova, who says, very nice presentation. I noticed the same problem with sorghum and aphids cultivated in Northern Kazakhstan. So that kind of wraps, right? That's full circle. These, these problems that are local are also global and we're an international group. 
studying these very same questions in different on the opposite sides of the world. So um, I think we're going to stop there and um, please thank me virtually, uh, help me thank Sajan virtually for uh, an excellent seminar and for coming to join us and tell him, tell us about this lovely work um, that he did um, with Joe Lewis's lab. So thanks all. And I hope to see you all back in November. And if you have any questions further, please dive into the journal, lots of detail there, or contact Dr. Grover or the corresponding author, uh, Dr. Joe Lewis, to ask questions of more details. And I, I hope that you'll find this inspiring in your own work. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you so much, bye.